Good morning. Good morning. Whether you decided to brave the cold weather or you're sitting at home in your comfy blankets, cuddled in, looking and watching and participating in worship that way, it is good for us to be together. So thank you for being here. Our worship for this, the third Sunday after Epiphany, begins with our bulletin, Confession and Forgiveness. Please rise. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, creator of darkness and light, word of truth, wind is sweeping over the waters. Amen. Let us confess our sin in the presence of God and of one another. God, our rock and our refuge, we pour out our hearts before you. We have known you, but have not always loved you. We have wounded one another and sinned against you. We have not always recognized the Holy Spirit dwelling in each of us. Remember your covenant. Renew your creation. Restore us that we might proclaim your good news to all. Amen. God declares, grace is here, and in Jesus Christ's authority, your sins are forgiven. You are cherished by God. Amen.
the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For this holy house, and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. Amen. This is the feast of victory for our God. Alleluia. For he is Christ the us pray. Almighty God, by grace alone you call us and accept us as in your service. Strengthen us by your spirit and make us worthy of your call. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. Good morning. Good morning. The first reading is from Jonah, the third chapter. The word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time, saying, Get up, go to Nineveh, that great city, and proclaim to it the message that I tell you. So Jonah set out and went to Nineveh, according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceedingly large city, a three days walk across. Jonah began to go into the city, going a day's walk. And he cried out, 40 days more and Nineveh shall be overthrown. And the people of Nineveh believed God. They proclaimed a fast and everyone, great and small, 
put on sackcloth. When God saw what they did, how they turned from their evil ways, God changed his mind about the calamity that he had said he would bring upon them, and he did not do it. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. silence. Truly my hope is in God. God alone is my rock and my salvation, my stronghold so that I shall never be shaken. In God is my deliverance and my honor. God is my strong rock and my refuge. Put your trust in God always, O oh people. Pour out your hearts before the one who is our refuge. God alone is my rock and my salvation. <laughs> Those of high degree are but a fleeting breath those of low estate cannot be trusted placed on the scales together they weigh even less than a breath put no trust in extortion in robbery take no empty pride though wealth increase set your heart upon it God has spoken once, twice, have I not heard it? The power belongs to God. Steadfast love belongs to you, O Lord, for you repay all according to their deeds. God alone is my rock and my salvation. The second reading is from 1 Corinthians, the seventh chapter. Brothers and sisters, the appointed time has grown short. From now on, let even those who have wives be as though they had none, and those who mourn as though they were not mourning, and those who rejoice as though they were not rejoicing, and those who buy as though they had no possessions, and those who deal with the world as though they had no dealings with it, for the present form of this world is passing away. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. for this, the third Sunday after Epiphany, comes from the first chapter of St. Mark. Glory, Glory to you, O Lord. Lord. <coughs> now after John was arrested, Jesus came to Galilee, proclaiming the good news of God and saying, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe in the good news. As Jesus passed along the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And Jesus said to them, follow me and I will make you fish for people. And immediately they left their nets and followed him. As he went a little further, he saw James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John, who were in their boats mending the nets. Immediately he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired men and followed him. 
the gospel of our Lord. Praise, Praise to you, O Christ. Christ. Please be seated. Grace and peace to you from God and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. So we've had quite the past few two weeks, haven't we? Three major snows in a two-week time period. I'm excited. But I've seen some of your posts. I've seen some of those Facebook notes about how snow disrupts our routine seen how snow causes extra work, sore muscles from shoveling, and if you're not careful, falls or twisted ankles like I did a few weeks back, or injuries of some kind. But I've also seen your posts about road conditions and driving carefully and staying home to be safe, and I've seen your posts about the beauty of the snow, of the birds, of the squirrels and other wildlife as they gather food for their days. I've seen your posts about playing in the snow, skiing, whether downhill or cross country, snowshoeing. I've seen snowball fights and of course, snow people. It's been a glorious two weeks with that white stuff. So imagine my surprise when I discovered that water was flowing throughout the scriptures as I looked at our pericope for today. The season of Epiphany is so rich with imagery. Following the visit of the wise ones, we have the baptism of Jesus in the River Jordan. We have that baptism by John the Baptist. And Jesus is revealed to the world in those waters as he begins his public ministry. You remember this, a voice from heaven declares Jesus as the beloved son of God and the spirit descends upon him, revealing an epiphany, an appearance of the divine. Then throughout the season, miracles and teachings reveal the divine nature, the mission, the authority and the power of this one who was baptized, this Jesus. And Epiphany uses the imagery of darkness and light quite well to emphasize that Jesus is the light of the world, bringing illumination and understanding to all of humanity, along with the all-inclusiveness of God's salvation. Throughout these weeks of Epiphany, we come to fathom the summons of what it means to be called to discipleship. And we recognize the transformative power of an encounter with Jesus and the enduring effects on one's life that arise from his call to us. <clears throat> Lastly, I have to add, in these days following the Epiphany event, they connect us to water directly. And we know water to be cleansing, to give rebirth and spiritual renewal. We know that water symbolically or metaphorically represents a connection between this present world and the immediate experience we have in this world and the timeless or eternal aspects of, of existence. It transcends the boundaries of time, creating this continuity between our current moment and something enduring and everlasting, we'll call it the eternal. The season of epiphany is all of that and more. I came across the notion that water, the water, water that is currently and presently in the world is essential, essentially the identical water that existed from the time of creation. That the ongoing cycles of evaporation and condensation initiated at the dawn of time have, 
have filtered and recycled the very same water molecules that once flooded the earth during Noah's time and now flow out of our kitchen taps. In essence, that too is a continuous and interconnected cycle of the same water throughout the ages. And I'd have to ask some of my scientist friends about that, but how utterly amazing would that be? That the water from Noah's time is the water that we are still using this day. River water flowing gently downstream creates opportunity for baptism. Cascading water descending from the sides of mountains in the forms of waterfalls. Clear water in our glasses that quenches our thirst when we drink it. Refreshing water sitting in fonts symbolizing rebirth and renewal, life. And that frozen water descending from the heavens as delicate white flakes that gracefully blanket the earth, adorning it with its own beauty. How amazing is that? Water is synonymous with our lives, isn't it? Our existence begins in water, and it, its essential role in our survival is really undeniable. Therefore, the symbolism of baptismal waters reflecting our spiritual birth and our rebirth and the significance of Jesus choosing the River Jordan for his baptism all become clear today. In essence, it's a recognition of the unity of all water in our understanding of this profound aspect of life. And how amazing is it that years ago, the writers of the lectionary decided to place these stories rich with water into the week when our lives have been so filled with frozen water. If one wanted to be funny, one could say today we look at the waters of Epiphany. Our Old Testament reading comes from Jonah, the third chapter. And here we see Jonah's second call. For the second time, Jonah was to go to the city of Nineveh and deliver a message from God. Here, the people of Nineveh respond to Jonah's message by repenting. But we have to pause for a moment to acknowledge that Jonah's story begins with that first call. God commands Jonah to go to the great city of Nineveh and deliver a message of impending judgment because of its wickedness. Instead of obeying God's command, Jonah tries to flee from the presence of the Lord and he goes to the port city of Joppa and he finds a ship a ship that is heading in the opposite direction of the way God wants him to go, to Tarshish. Jonah pays the fare and boards the ship, intending to escape from God's assignment. And in response to Jonah's disobedience, God sends this great wind on the sea, causing a violent storm. And the sailors on the ship become terrified. And each cries out to his own God for help. And as the storm rages, the sailors cast lots to determine who is responsible for the calamity. And do you know the story? A lot falls on Jonah. And he admits that he is fleeing from the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the sea and the dry land. Recognizing that Jonah is the cause of the storm, the sailors ask him, what they should do to calm this storm. And Jonah suggests that they throw him to the sea. Believing that it will calm the storm, he's willing to give his life to not follow God's command. So reluctantly, the sailors throw Jonah into the sea and immediately the storm ceases and what does God do? But God sends a great big fish to swallow Jonah. And he remains in the belly of the fish for three days and three nights. 
that holds significance too. While in the belly of the fish, Jonah prays, and God calls him a second time. That is the story that we remember about Jonah, the whale and the water. Now, Jonah's prayer that I mentioned earlier was really a cry to God. So Jonah repents. Now, repentance serves as this crucial element in maintaining obedience to God. It goes beyond mere verbal apologies, and it needs actions or inactions. Let me try that one again. It goes beyond mere verbal apologies for those actions we've done or those inactions we haven't done. Repentance involves this profound change in our direction, a complete turnaround. When we repent, we not only express our remorse, but we actively redirect our lives. It's a transformative 180 degree shift in our perspectives where we abandon our previous ways of thinking and living and we fully turn towards something new, something God directed. Just think about it. It took a very large fish and three days for, no, for Jonah to repent and to become obedient to God. And it was Jonah's obedience to God that sets him up for the exact same call, just a little trouble later. God wants this done, he says to Jonah. And Jonah complies with God's command. And this narrative reveals layers upon layers of repentance. So beyond mere obedience, he goes a step further by reversing his course. He not only follows God's directive, but he also makes a complete physical turnaround from his initial path to Tarshish. And he chooses to return to Nineveh, going the other direction. And this signifies a profound act of repentance, as Jonah not only changes his actions, but retraces his steps, fully embracing a new direction in alignment with God's will. It teaches me, don't take the extra steps, just listen from the beginning. But how hard is that for us to do? Back to our pericope. God commands Jonah for this second time to go to Nineveh and proclaim God's message of impending judgment. And the people of Nineveh repent, and they seek God's forgiveness. They turn from their evil ways, and God saw their repentance, and he relented, which means that God changed God's mind. From proceeding with the impending disaster, God stopped it. So one could argue in this text that God, in a sense, also undergoes a change or some repentance, leading to a shift in God's intention, ultimately granting Nineveh a second chance. And that reminds us that in repentance, when individuals respond to that call for repentance, God redeems, proving once again that God is willing to forgive and God extends mercy and grace. So the waters of Epiphany cleanse and renew everyone, Jonah, the Ninevites, and God. And just as we see Jonah transformed by the power of the water, so too you and I are transformed in the sacrament of the waters of baptism. Our sins are forgiven. We are welcomed into the Christian community. We undergo spiritual rebirth, and we commit to embracing a new way of life. These waters of Epiphany continue into our gospel as well. We are on the shores of the Sea of Galilee. While no one is held captive in those waters by a big fish, Jesus stands at the waterside and calls his first disciples. And his first disciples are fishermen. In this context, the water serves not just as a backdrop, 
but it represents livelihood and the natural surroundings of these fishermen. Here, water signifies the transformative impact of God's call. Follow me and I will make you fish for people. This metaphor implies a shift in the disciples' focus. So instead of catching fish, they are now called to fish for people, meaning that they are to bring people into the teachings and the beliefs of Jesus the Christ. And it signifies a change in their life's purpose and a commitment to spreading the message of the kingdom of God. So Jesus' call is not just about a change in occupation, but a call to believe in and spread the good news of the kingdom of God. Now this kingdom is portrayed as something different from the norm, emphasizing values and love and discipline or, and divine principles. The disciples are being prepared for this transformative journey of faith and service by undertaking God's call. And this call that Jesus gives them is laying the foundation for a new way of life centered around Jesus and that kingdom that God calls us to. Just take a moment. Take a moment to, respond, to ponder how radical this shift was for these men. Unaware of the full extent of what lay ahead, they willingly abandoned everything and they wholeheartedly embraced a new and unfamiliar path without any hesitation. How willing are we to do the same when God calls? Does it take a fish in three days and three nights? I don't know. The use of water in our stories, in this story, the gospel reading, symbolizes the potential for transformation, for cleansing and renewal associated with both the call to repentance and the disciples' choices to follow Jesus. And it is the Sea of Galilee that becomes a significant setting where ordinary fishermen are being called to a higher purpose and water becomes this powerful symbol in the unfolding narrative of discipleship and ministry. On this third Sunday after Epiphany, the call of Jesus extends to both you and to me as well, urging us to embrace belief in the kingdom and to embark on this journey of faith and service, a profound journey, I might add. And we are encouraged to boldly cast our nets into the waters of discipleship. We don't know where it's going to take us, or where it's going to lead, but we are inspired by the call of Jesus. Drawing inspiration from the story of Jonah, we are prompted to actively engage in the transformative journey of following Christ, of placing our trust in the abundance of life and purpose that awaits us on that journey. It is not just, this commitment is not just a mere obligation nor does it stem from a sincere spirit of repentance. Let me rephrase that sentence too. This commitment is not just a mere obligation, but it really truly does stem from a sincere spirit of repentance, of turning around, finding a new way, being guided to that new way. So throughout the scriptures, we consistently receive invitations from God to dynamically participate in an ever-flowing realm of discipleship. Much like those fishermen casting their nets with anticipation, we too are prompted to approach discipleship openly, anticipating the transformative power inherent in Christ's call. And this also aligns with the waters and the narrative in Jonah, urging us to embark on a journey with some sense of expectancy and a trust in the richness that comes from what Jesus asks us to do. Discipleship, my friends, is not a passive endeavor. It requires active and intentional responses to what Jesus calls us to do. It means casting nets 
and being willing to let go of the familiar and venture into that which is unknown. It is an act of surrender. Acknowledging that Christ's call can lead us into new depths and challenges us to leave our comfort zones and embrace an adventure. And the symbolism of water here, of living water in these scriptures, highlights the dynamic and life-giving nature of Christ's teaching and the presence the Holy Spirit has on this community. Casting nets invites us to immerse ourselves in the abundant grace and the abundant wisdom and the love overflowing from Christ. It is an act of faith. It is trusting that by embracing the call of Jesus, we discover spiritual nourishment beyond our expectations. And furthermore, the call to discipleship is a call to this community, to a community. Just as fishermen work together to cast their nets and haul in the catch, we are called to journey together as a community of believers. Discipleship is not a solitary pursuit. It's a shared experience where we support and we uplift one another, where we recognize that the harvest that God wants is abundant when we work in unity. So let us this day respond actively to the call of Jesus, to that invitation to leave behind the safety of the shore and trust in the transformative power of God's call. This journey is not a mere venture into the unknown. It is a deliberate step towards a deeper relationship with God. It embraces the call of Jesus. It leads us on a path to a more meaningful and purposeful life in Jesus' service. May we, may we commit. May we support each other individually and collectively as we, each of us, cast our nets with faith and with anticipation. Because the journey of discipleship promises a fulfilling and a mission-focused life in Christ. Here's the water. Amen.
Let us join together in professing our faith through the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the, com- the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. <clears throat> As we celebrate Christ embodied in human form, we pray for God's blessing upon the church, the world, and upon all of creation. God, our rock and our deliverer, do not let your church be shaken. We trust you. Never abandon your promises to the most vulnerable among us. Give your church wisdom and empathy in its varied ministries. Lord, in your mercy, God of hope and refuge, you place the fish in the sea. Guide our care of oceans and all creatures that live in them. Hold us accountable for actions that endanger water sources and the people who depend on them. Lord, in your mercy, God who proclaims judgment and who offers mercy, be a model to the leaders of our nation and to the world. As they lead, may they follow in your way of justice and truth. Lord, in your mercy. God, who cares for the suffering, care for survivors of assault and sexual abuse, and sustain all who minister to them. Keep safe all who live under threat of violence, those living in poverty and any among us who are ill or in pain. We pray this day for those who live outside. May they be warm this day. Lord, in your mercy, God of resurrection and new life, as the first disciples shared the good news, empower us and this faith community to be open to your call. When we are uncertain of your call, assure us. And when we have strayed from your ways, redirect us. Use a fish if necessary. Lord, in your mercy, God who holds the saints against your tender bosom, we trust you. Welcome them in with your care, into your care. Comfort those who grieve, even as we place our hope in your salvation. Lord, in your mercy, Amen. knowing the Holy Spirit intercedes for us, we offer these prayers and the silent prayers of our hearts to you in the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you. Let us share a sign of Christ's peace with one another.
Let us pray. Blessed are you, Holy One, for all good things come from you. In bread and cup, you open heaven to us. Meet us at this table that we receive what we seek. And follow your Son, Jesus, in whose name we pray. Amen. Amen. The Holy One be with you. And also with you. Open your hearts to the one who is love. We open our hearts to you, Lord. Let us give thanks to God who welcomes the stranger. To the one who reaches across every border, we give thanks and praise. In wonder of your expansive embrace, we give you praise, O oh God. Through your radical welcome, you reveal the limitations of our own imaginations, and you break down walls and boundaries we don't even realize that we have erected. Like the Magi guided by the light of the star through foreign territory, you call us all towards you. You lend your people, you, you lead your people across borders of hate and into lands of curious and different. You strengthen us as we journey, learning and unlearning stories about one another. Gathered in your presence, we come to recognize the gifts of community that are rich in diversity. Therefore, we join our, voice, our voices with all your people on earth and the whole company of the heavens singing praises to you. In mysterious ways, O oh God, this journey with you is filled with more questions than answers. And each time we think we have you figured out, you surprise us again, revealing yourself in new ways. In Jesus, we saw your radical welcome of strangers extended in challenging ways, ways that disrupt our traditions and unsettle our comfort zones. Jesus broke religious rules in order to include all people. He lifted up the sacredness of the people and places that were deemed unclean. He cared more about the well-being of the oppressed than of his own reputation. Jesus taught us to rethink your presence among us, but we couldn't accept it. Resistance to tr resistant to transformation, your people sent him to the cross. And on the night of his arrest, Jesus shared a meal with his companions. He took bread, he blessed it, he broke it, and he gave it to his disciples, and he said, this is my body which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After the meal, he took the cup. He blessed it and shared it, saying, this cup that is poured out is the new covenant. In remembrance of all you have done to save us, we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ was birthed among us. Christ was killed among us. Christ rises among us. May the same spirit that lifted Christ from the grave be poured out upon these gifts. Make this bread and this cup be an extension of your welcome, a welcome that knows no bounds. Fill us with the courage and the faith to join you in the work of tearing down walls that exclude and pointing to the sacred in the margins. In collective longing for a taste of your kingdom on earth, we all join together in echoing the prayer of Jesus. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. At Jesus' table, 
Heaven and earth are joined as one. Come and see.
please rise. The body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace. Amen. Amen. Let us pray. God, our Redeemer, giver of every gift, God, Christ's body is our food and we are Christ's body. Raise us to life by your power for the benefit of all and to your glory, now and forever. Amen. Amen. The God who names you, Christ who claims you, and the Holy Spirit who dwells within you, bless you and remain with you always. Amen. 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 Please be seated for the announcements. Good morning. Good morning, and thank you to the 30 people who braved the wind chills to be here today. Monday at 10 a.m., there will be soup making for the homeless. Pastor will be making chicken noodle soup and beef vegetable soup to distribute to the homeless in our community. If you can help, we will start cooking at 1030 on Monday which is tomorrow. Below is a list of items we will need, or we will accept monetary donations. We need noodles, chicken breast, vegetables, potatoes, onions, celery, nor vegetable soup dip, <laughs> better than bouillon chicken flavored, and butter. Also, we are collecting items to donate to our local homeless community. We're asking for tarps, six by eight feet or larger, old blankets, duct tape, electrolyte drinks such as Gatorade, Powerade, etc. We need toilet paper and beef jerky such as Slim Jims, salty snacks like granola bars, chips, anything you like to eat, I'm sure they like to eat. <laughs> Hygiene items, individual sizes, and of course, socks, heavy, warm socks. Tuesday, Pastor Will, once again, at 2 and 7 p.m., continue our Christian life study in the pastor's office. But beginning in the morning at 9.30 to 1.45 p.m., the Red Cross Drive will be here. Doing well, there are 39 signed up. Fantastic, 39, but there's, there are four slots left. Anyone, please. Wednesday at 12.30, we will have Bible study in the library. And of course, next Sunday, we will have our word and sacrament. Today, after worship, we were to have wel the welcome meeting. Is that still going to go on? Since Priscilla's not here. Oh, next Sunday. I'm sorry. Next Sunday. Forget that. <laughs> Don't stay for the welcome meeting. And of course, next Wednesday, the first Wednesday club will have their Valentine bingo party. It will be on February 7th, actually, at 2 p.m. in Luther Hall. Please bring two $5 gifts and any food you would like to share. Any other announcements? I would just like to add that after worship today, because some items have already come in, we're going to be doing some chopping and cutting in Luther Hall. If anyone wishes to assist, you're more than welcome to come help us cut up vegetables.
Go in peace. You are God's beloved. Thanks be to God.